Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko has recently reiterated his readiness to hold a referendum on NATO membership, and opinion polls strongly suggest that the Ukrainian public would vote overwhelmingly in favour. But is NATO ready for Ukraine? We're joined in the studio by Alexander Vinikov, who's the head of the NATO representation in Ukraine. Alexander, thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. If Ukraine voted to join NATO, would that be a bit of a headache for NATO, potentially? Well, I think uh, Ukraine is a sovereign country, and um, as any sovereign country, it has the right to, to take any decisions that it wishes. Um, therefore, uh, we respect uh, whatever choice uh, sovereign nations make. Um, I think it's important to, to note that Ukraine at this stage has not decided to pursue NATO membership, has not lo lodged a, a corresponding application. Uh, if it were to, to do that, then it would be considered by allies uh, as any other application would. Um, so that is the, um, the position of, of uh, the alliance. Uh, I think that um, Ukraine today is um, focusing on reforming the country, on modernizing its security and defense sector. And uh, that is, uh, I think, the priority right now, to focus on uh, reforms and to consider uh, the membership issue uh, further down the line. At least that is the, uh, the leadership's uh, approach. And NATO is here to support that, that process of reforming uh, the security and defense sector in accordance with NATO standards and principles. Based on past experience of other, other countries that have joined the alliance over the last few decades, I mean, what sort of time frames are we talking about here? How long after a positive decision at the Ukrainian end could it come to a, an actual vote amongst member states? I think there's... Uh, we can't really put any numbers on, on that. Uh, it all depends on uh, the country in question uh, meeting the standards of NATO membership. And these standards are not just technical standards, um, which are codified in the so-called STANAGs, but they're also about um, standards of democracy, standards of uh, rule of law, uh, human rights, uh, market economy, uh, etc. So um, I think the important thing is to keep reforming and to keep modernizing uh, the country if it wishes to pursue uh, Euro-Atlantic integration. Now, how does it impact on the calculus within NATO, the fact that support for membership has increased approximately three or fourfold over the last few years, for obvious reasons, and NATO membership was never a, uh, a very popular agenda in Ukraine until the outbreak of the, the current conflict in East Ukraine and the occupation of Crimea. Now, the opinion polls strongly suggest that any vote would be, would be close to a landslide victory for Ukraine. Uh, in, in the discussions in Brussels and amongst NATO member states, how, what, what sort of a factor does that play? Well, I think that allies uh, have been steadfast in their support for Ukraine, um, particularly uh, since the beginning of the Russian aggression against, against Ukraine. Uh, and allies are committed to um, supporting Ukraine through the established uh, mechanisms of cooperation. Uh, this year, we are actually celebrating the 20th anniversary of the signature of the distinctive partnership between NATO and Ukraine. Uh, under that distinctive partnership, many instruments have been created, such as the NATO-Ukraine Commission, the um, uh, various programs like um, the, the planning and review process, the uh, annual national program that Ukraine has uh, with NATO. Uh, those, I think, are some key, uh, key programs that uh, are being implemented. And uh, in particular, the annual national program is a unique instrument that uh, Ukraine has to get closer to NATO. Uh, and it doesn't only cover uh, security and defense issues, uh, but also political, economic and legal reforms. So through that instrument, uh, Ukraine can make a lot of progress um, in coming closer to NATO standards. Is this the priority for the coming year, then, the, the, these cooperation partnership projects? So if membership itself is, is not on the table, then what, what is going to be the priority for the, for the immediate future, for the, interim, you know, for the intermediate period? Right. Well, I already mentioned the uh, annual national program. That is a key um, roadmap that should uh, outline Ukraine's reform ambitions and goals uh, in its relationship with NATO, but uh, uh, mostly for itself, um, to modernize and reform the country. 
Um, then we also have um, a, an overarching uh, package of assistance called the Comprehensive Assistance Package, uh, which was endorsed by uh, heads of state and government when uh, the NATO-Ukraine Commission last met uh, at that level uh, in uh, Warsaw. Um, now, that uh, assistance package is very uh, broad and uh, contains uh, 40 tailored support measures uh, in 13 key areas. So I think the, 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 the priority now is to implement uh, all of those activities, uh, particularly this year we're looking at continuing the implementation of the five trust funds which, uh, which were created uh, during the Wales uh, summit. Um, of continuing our uh, capacity building programs in defense education, in professional development, in anti-corruption, um, and, and also our advisory support. Uh, we have a team of advisors here uh, that are working directly with their Ukrainian counterparts to facilitate uh, reform of the security and defense sector and to help uh, build uh, capacity and capabilities for Ukraine uh, to be able to better uh, provide for its own security. Now, on the specific subject of uh, adapting NATO standards within the military, I mean, this, is a, this is a priority outside of the framework of potential future membership bid or not. I mean, this is, this is a, a security issue for Ukraine, as you, as you say. What sort of progress has been made over the past few years? We hear, we hear quite often that the Ukrainian military has undergone enormous change. Essentially, <clears throat> two or three years ago when the conflict began, the, the military was in total disarray. Now, uh, it's, improved, it's significantly improved its performance. But from your point of view, from a NATO perspective, how efficient has it become and uh, where have the key gains been made? Well, I think you're right, Peter, is that in, in that um, from a, a very limited fighting force at the beginning of the uh, aggression, uh, Ukraine has now clearly made uh, enormous strides in, in boosting its uh, defensive capabilities uh, and is able to contain uh, the Russian aggression at its current level. Um, so gains have been made and reforms have been implemented in areas such as uh, medical care, uh, logistics, uh, uniforms, um, and, uh, and, and some other areas. Um, the problem with those reforms is that they're not necessarily systemic reform. And that is what we uh, have been trying to, to focus on, uh, to help Ukraine implement, plan and implement uh, systemic reform uh, in line with the best uh, NATO uh, and Euro-Atlantic standards. And training this year, we see already the, the American has a, America has a, a strong training presence in West Ukraine, Yavariv. Uh, the Canadians have been involved, the Brits have been involved. Uh, there's going to be some significant, some quite large uh, joint exercises with NATO over the, over the coming year. Can you tell us a little bit about those operations? Yes, well, I think um, NATO and allies uh, taken together have been providing uh, quite a substantive uh, amount of, of, of support to Ukraine's uh, security and defense sector. Uh, from the NATO side, uh, as an organization, we've been focusing, as I said, on uh, strategic advice and on the trust funds, which um, are addressing particular areas of need, like uh, logistics and standardization, uh, like medical rehabilitation, uh, cyber uh, security is another uh, area, uh, military career transition is also the subject of one of our uh, trust funds. Uh, and we have also recently added a new trust fund, which will uh, work on counter uh, improvised, improvised explosive devices and explosive ordnance uh, disposal. Uh, the Allies, coming to your question, yeah. uh, on a bilateral level, have been uh, working at the more sort of tactical and operational levels to train um, Ukrainian units uh, in Yavoriv and in other locations. So um, you have a number of nations like the US, uh, the UK, Canada, uh, Lithuania, uh, who have been particularly active in this regard, with hundreds of uh, trainers uh, being involved in these in these uh, training missions. Um, so all in all, I think the alliance as a as a whole is contributing quite significantly, and uh, I expect that uh, that support to continue uh, this year. We can look at it from the 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 other side, as it were. Ukraine's military now, and Ukraine as a state, has has unique experience of dealing with the, f the types of hybrid aggression we're seeing from Russia, which are, are novel in, in the current military context. Uh, 
To what extent do you think that NATO members can actually come here or, or interact with Ukraine and learn from Ukraine? So the, you know, the training has sense mm -hmm. going in the other direction. Is that, is that a tendency you're seeing or you could see developing in the coming years? Certainly, it's a two-way process. Um, I hear uh, when I chat to, uh, to people who are involved in this, uh, these bilateral training missions that they pick up a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting insights uh, and uh, experiences from, from the people they are training. So clearly, it's a two-way two -way street. Um, at the same time, you mentioned uh, hybrid uh, warfare. This is one of the novel areas um, which we are currently exploring uh, together with our Ukrainian uh, partners. It is one of the, the new areas also mentioned in the comprehensive assistance package. Uh, and there, uh, allies committed to helping uh, Ukraine develop a, a so-called hybrid warfare platform uh, to uh, exchange uh, lessons learned and um, uh, sort of share knowledge about these new types of threats, which unfortunately uh, Ukraine has been exposed to uh, perhaps even more than, than uh, NATO allies have. I would say so, yeah, certainly. Uh, information warfare is a huge component part of the, of the, the hybrid warfare concept. Uh, NATO is very often a part of that in the sense that it is a, it is a, to, a, a popular target for disinformation. Uh, what can NATO be doing, do you think, in Ukraine and internationally to, to debunk some of these myths and dispel some of the, uh, the disinformation that is quite, quite commonly put out about NATO's role in the region? Well, I think our, uh, the basic uh, tenet of our strategy is not to counter propaganda with propaganda. So we counter propaganda with facts and uh, we use uh, all sorts of platforms to, uh, to, to uh, convey those facts and to, to share them. Um, on the air, online, um, publications, we, we use all uh, available platforms, increasingly with social media, I should say. Um, there's a special section uh, also on the NATO website called Setting the Record Straight, uh, which actively debunks uh, many myths that uh, Russian uh, media has been, uh, has been producing about NATO, uh, including about U NATO's involvement in Ukraine. Uh, on the local level here in Ukraine, I think that uh, both the NATO Liaison Office and the NATO Information and Documentation Center, uh, which together are now the NATO representation to Ukraine, uh, we are extremely uh, open uh, and engaged with the media, uh, with civil society, uh, with young people. Also, we have uh, social media presences. Uh, we are present on Twitter. So we, we try to uh, be as open as we, as we can. And frankly, it's, it's not difficult because everything we do is, um, is open to the public, really. Um, well, uh, thank you for your efforts. Uh, please stay open, stay with us. Uh, we hope to see you again and, and communicate the latest news from NATO. Alexander, thank you much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. You're watching UATV. Oh, <laughs>